אשר קידשנו במצוותיו, וציוונו להדליק נר חנוכה. האימפריה הגדולה בעולם ביקשה למחוק את הזהות היהודית, והעם היהודי נלחם בחירוף נפש, ממש כאן, במקום הסמוך ביותר למקום נס פח השמן, כדי לשמר את האור היהודי בעולם. הנרות הללו שאנו מדליקים נגד כל הגזרות, נגד האנטישמיות החדשה, כפי שניצחנו אז, ננצח גם היום. חג שמח. We all know the miracles of Hanukkah, the military victory of the Maccabees against the Greeks, and the miracle of the oil that should have lasted one day but instead burned for eight. But there was a third miracle not many people know about, and it took place several centuries later. After the destruction of the Second Temple, many rabbis were convinced that Hanukkah should be abolished. After all, it celebrated the rededication of the temple, and the temple now was no more. It had been destroyed by the Romans under Titus. Without a temple, what was there to celebrate? The Talmud tells us that in at least one town, Lud, Hanukkah was actually abolished. Yet eventually, the other view prevailed, which is why we celebrate Hanukkah to this day. Why? Because though the temple was destroyed, Jewish hope was not destroyed. We may have lost the building, but we still had the story and the memory and the light. And what had happened once in the days of the Maccabees could happen again. And it was those words, od lo avda tikvatenu, our hope is not destroyed, that became part of the song Hatikva that inspired Jews to return to Israel and to Jerusalem and rebuild their ancient state. So as you light the Hanukkah candles, remember this. The Jewish people kept hope alive, and hope kept the Jewish people alive. We are the voice of hope in the conversation of humankind. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah Samar. significant that we're seeing an olive tree and its connection to Hanukkah because these hills are alive with the sound of Hanukkah. The Greeks had a base in Shamron and Sebastia and they moved up and down this highway, Highway 60 of today, the main road going through the mountain passes. Some scholars say that the pass that we are about to enter is also from the main roads. And we're about to find out how the Maccabees were able to secretly hide in these hills, attack whole armies, and disappear. The main road is just there. We've attacked the Greeks. Quick, let's go into the hiding cave. Hundreds of soldiers could stay in this cave. There are about 20 caves just in this canyon. Thousands of soldiers could be here. Moments after attacking the Greeks on the main road, they could disappear in these camouflaged caves, which have piers to allow light and air in. This is just one of the strategies that the Hasmoneans used fighting the Greeks. This ragtag band has been attacking Greek soldiers and Hellenists trying to follow Antiochus Epiphanes IV just a bit too much. It's time to put an end to this. We're going to march from our base in Sebastia, the ancient Israelite capital of Shomron, from the north to the south, and we'll just take care of them. We know where they are in the hills of Modiin. The far hills here are Mount Grizim and Har Eval, with Shem in between. Ancient Shamron is about the same height, just over to the left. 
So two full armies led by the general Apollonius come marching into this valley by Luban. The modern Arab town of Luban is retaining that name, which goes all the way back to Ma'ale Livona, which is to the west of the road facing Shiloh, which is where we are right near Shiloh. So here in this valley in the Shamron come the powerful Greek army, undefeated, the ones who beat the Persians 150 years ago, with the phalanx, with the spears out, untouchable. Here they come marching into the valley, leaving a hundred men behind them in the distance. They ascend here and Yudha Maccabee attacks with almost no weapons. But the surprise, and as they're coming up the defiles of the narrow valleys, they don't have their military advantage. They kill two Greek armies, and Yudha Maccabee takes Apollonius's sword. Now they have equipment. Now they've shown success. More people join their cause. As the historian Moshe Perman points out, they showed they could be successful. They gave hope. But they went to fight without knowing they would be victorious. They were kanaim in that they said, life cannot go on like this. Mi lashem a lie. We won't stand for this, no matter what the odds, no matter what the consequences are. Ain somchim al hanes. You can't rely on miracles. But once you are Moser nefesh, you can have a miracle happen. And that's what happened. These were few attacking the many, and God helped them. Rabim fell biad matim in the hands of the few. You can't rely on miracles. Ain somchim al hanes. But when somebody is most nefesh, which means that they're giving over their life, they're ready to give their life. Sometimes they merit the miracle. It's a discussion why we like the, the they wrote the lamps eight days when the miracle was only seven days, the Beis Yosef's question. One approach is the Nitzachon, the fact that they were victorious against the greatest army the world knew at the time is a reason for the celebration. The most difficult battle perhaps was here because we don't know what will be. We are not an army. There were very challenging battles later, but they were already an army. Here? What, are you nuts? Are you crazy? It worked. And so we're overlooking the sight of a miracle. Here, the Greek army fell at the hand of some Kohanim and their followers, the Kanaim, the Chashmonaim. This is the scene of the miracle by Luban Ma'ale Levona. This is a Shomeira. Shomer means a watchman. This is a place a watchman can live while watching his flocks in the valley below, while guarding his ripening crops. Fruit trees of all kinds are all around it, here near Shiloh. It is made without any cement. All these stones are fitted into one another. The Mishnah in Baba Batra, fourth chapter, says a Shomeira made without tit, without cement, is sold together with the field. If I sold you a field, automatically this is included. Were it to be made with cement, it would be a separate item. This, according to the archaeologist Zev Yevin, told Ira Rappaport, from based on the pottery, it's from the time of the first temple. There are about 60 Shomeiraz around in this area of the Shomron. It's intact enough for us to walk inside underground and for us to stand on top. There used to be a smaller dome to the right, perhaps for the children, so the whole family could be here, but that collapsed in recent years. Shomeira made without any cement standing here in the field in the Shomron. The people of Israel love the land of Israel. In the time of the first temple, when this Shomeira, where this guard tower and watch booth is from, everybody had their own inheritance, divided by tribe and then by family house. 
In the time of the Second Temple, the Jews here loved the land, knew it and understood it. That was a key to the Maccabees' success. They knew the land, they knew the lay of the land, they knew where's the valley, where's the top of the hill, from where to attack. It's from their love of the land of Eretz Yisrael that they were able to then produce the military successes with the help of God. Shalom, it's Ivan Rav Meir from Yerushalayim. Welcome, welcome to this Mizrahi project, another great Mizrahi project, now for Hanukkah. Mi Hashem Elai, that's the topic, that's the headline. I do want to share one story about heroism, about gvura, about strength, and I, in a way, it's something I've heard as, as a journalist here in Israel. I heard it from Natan Sharansky, the famous uh, Natan Sharansky. I had an interview with him and with his wife, Avital. They gave me a, an exclusive interview, just the two of them, the first time they sat and told for the first time they shared that heroic chapter in our history. And uh, it was fascinating. We sat for two, three hours. At the end of the meeting, I asked them, why do you give me this interview? Why do you speak after 30 years, 30 years since he really was released from, from jail? And they gave me a beautiful answer about nowadays, heroism, about our voix in our generation. After discussing what happened to them, the secret wedding they had, an illegal wedding in Moscow, and the way he was arrested and investigated, millions of investigations by the KGB people, not so nice, and spending 12 and a half years inside a small cell in jail, 12 and a half years, hunger strike, uh, he was hungry and thirsty, he tried to keep Shabbat, to calculate when is Hanukkah. Um, it was awful, it was hard. But his answer was, why do you give me this interview? Remember the question? His answer was, I speak now because I want every Jew to know that he is braver than me. And I was like, hmm, maybe I do not hear what you said. How can I be braver than you? Each Jew that is watching you is braver than you. Are you braver than him? Anyone here ever spent one night in Russian jail? Two KGB investigations? N n nothing, right? How can I be braver than him? I'm an Israeli journalist, married to Yedidia, mother of five. I'm not braver than Cheransky. But he said yes. When I was in jail, everything was crystal clear. It's very easy, it's hard physically, but mentally, spiritually, you know right from wrong. It's like so obvious. I am identified with everything that is positive and they are ident identified with everything that is negative. No confusion. The minute I walked out from jail, he said, I became confused and I'm still confused since this world is confusing. Nobody's chasing you. Nobody's forcing you. Nobody tells you, oh, don't do this. Don't keep Shabbat. Don't be Jewish. Don't, nothing. You can do whatever you want. The world is open. Everything is accessible. Everything is available. You don't have to choose to commit to nothing, nothing. Do whatever you want. Don't define yourself. We don't care. It's a problem. There's nobody chasing us here behind our shoulder. No Hitler, Amalek, Nebuchadnezzar, Antiochus, no one. Baruch Hashem, all those mean guys are gone. And now what? It's our decision and we should choose. Do we want to be proud, engaged, devoted Jews? Are we committed? Or just because they were chasing us, we had so much self-devotion, so much Mesirut Nefesh. And Sharansky said, each Jew today in our liberal open world that chooses that identity, that is identified with Judaism, Zionism, Israel, Ivrit, Torah, Mitzvot, all those values, that's bravery, that's heroism, that's gvura. So don't think Hanukkah belongs to the past. Oh, we celebrate their gvura. We celebrate your gvura, current gvura, right here, right now. And if you're part of that project, you're obviously givorim. So keep up that spirit of gvura, and may we we'll meet each other, Be'ezrat Hashem, soon here in Yerushalayim. Chag Hanukkah Sameach. אני מרגיש שאני שליח כל חיי. אני לא אחזיר את נשמתי לבורא, משאני אגיד, רגע, רגע, תעצרו, אני לא גמרתי לעשות אחת, שתיים, שלוש, ארבע. את האתגרים שאני רוצה לעשות אותם, אני אעשה ואני אקשיב. דובר צה"ל מוסר כי סמוך לשעה שתיים פתחו הכוחות המצריים והסוריים בהצלחה.
במלחמת יום הכיפורים, המאבק מול הסורים היה מאבק קשה מאוד. הכל רועד, הכל אדמה שחורה מפיצוצים. הקרב האחרון על הגולן, אז אני מזהה טנק סורי, נכנס לתוך העמדה שלי, ועומד חמישה מטר מימיני. אני עליתי בו, מפקד הטנק הסורי, ראיתי אותו קופץ מן הטנק, וכולו שרוף, עונה באש, והוא צועק, ואני רואה אותו, ואז אני חוטף שיתוק. אני רואה את עצמי, אני רואה את עצמי קופץ מן הטנק. אני לוקח את עצמי בכוח, אני לוקח את הטנק שלי לבד ואני מחליט לנסוע קדימה. ואז אני דוהר ואני רואה את הצד הסורי. כל הצד הסורי אני רואה 150-160 טנקים דוהרים, חצו את הגבול ודוהרים אל הגבעה פה. כלומר, אם הם יעלו על הגבעה, הם רוצים לגליל. ואני עומד שם, אני מבין את המצב שהוא אה, נואש לגמרי, ואני מוצא את השבעה טנקים שלי ועוד איזה ארבעה, חמישה. ואני היחידי בעולם שיודע מה קורה בצד הזה של הגבעה. ואני מחליט להסתער, ואני נותן פקודות, ולא, אף אחד לא זז, ואני נותן עוד פעם פקודות, לא זזים. אני אומר ללוחמים שלי, אנחנו יהודים, אנחנו יותר טובים מהם, האם אני מזהה פה פחדנים? מי שרוצה שיצטרף אליי. התחלתי לזוז, פתאום ראיתי עוד טנק בא, עוד טנק בא. התפללתי לאלוהים, אלוהים. תעשה שאני אגיע לגבעה לפני שכל המסה הגדולה הזו עולה פה. כי אחרי זה הם שוחטים אותנו. סוף הקרב נגמר, שאנחנו נשארנו אולי שלושה טנקים בתפקידים, מאות של טנקים סורים שוכבים שם למטה, מושמדים. You're broken down and tired A living life on the merry-go-round And you can find the fighter But I see it in you So we gon' walk it out And move כמות המוות שראיתי סביבי הייתה גדולה מאוד עכשיו אני קברתי עם הרבה מאוד חברים תמיד חשבתי על הרגע שאני קובר אותם, שאני זורק את העט חפירה והבום הזה שנופל על הארון, שהוא שוכב שם בפנים ואומר, תעצור רגע, אני עוד לא נתתי עט, עוד לא כתבתי שיר, עוד לא עשיתי ילד, עוד לא התחתנתי. צל המוות גורם לך לרצות להספיק. אתה אומר לעצמך, סליחה. אני לא אבקש שתחזירו אותי כי לא סיימתי איזה משימה. אני אעשה את הכל. התחושה הזו של שליחות בשבילי היא מאוד סמלית שאני כל הזמן מניף את הדגל של המדינה. הדגל ייפול, לא יהיה לנו בית. אתה שם את הדגל בראש הגבעה, הגבעה שלך. <מח> 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 <מח>